Okay, good day, uh, everyone. As I said a second ago, it's uh, Tim Richter here, President of Canadian Lines and Homelessness. Thank you all for uh, joining us. I'm very uh, glad and very happy to welcome Ian DeYoung of Org Code uh, to join us uh, to talk, to begin a uh, webinar series on uh, encampments. As all of you uh, will know, uh, encampments have always been a challenge and unsheltered homelessness has always been a challenge um, for those of us in the homelessness sector. Um, but now with COVID, we're seeing a, a fairly rapid rise of unsheltered homelessness and large, uh, large scale encampments across the country. So the timing uh, of, this, uh, of this webinar series is, uh, is very good. Uh, and it's a very important topic and I'm glad that uh, Ian has uh, come along. We're gonna be doing a series of webinars with, uh, with Ian. We're also, uh, Ian's also working on a toolkit or guide uh, to respond to large scale uh, encampments. We're hoping to have a first draft of that out uh, shortly, knowing full well how, uh, how challenging that this, uh, this issue is for many uh, communities across the country. So we have an hour this morning. Our agenda is pretty straightforward. We're, I'm just going to do a quick introduction. Uh, Ian will have a presentation for about 40, 45 minutes, and then we have time uh, for questions and answer, and we will close right at uh, top of the hour. Uh, just a couple of quick housekeeping points. Uh, everyone is muted. This is a fairly large uh, webinar. Uh, and so we need to keep everybody on mute, but we certainly welcome a conversation. So use the chat function to share comments and speak to other participants. Uh, also, please use the question and answer tab to post your questions and we will um, make sure to ask uh, them to Ian uh, afterwards. And also so you know, we'll be posting a recording in this webinar uh, on our website. So if you go to the blogs on our website, it, the blog is on encampment webinar series. There you'll find a links to register for the future webinars, part of me, and also find a recording of this webinar. Uh, so if you're on this webinar, you probably already know Ian. I won't read his, his, uh, his bio, but uh, suffice to say that uh, he is uh, one of uh, North America's most recognized and sought after trainers and consultants on encampments and many other things. We had him yesterday doing a series on uh, shelter transformation, which by the way, if, if you are struggling with encampments in your communities, there's probably a really good opportunity to also be talking about shelters and shelter transformation in, in your communities, but I'll leave, uh, leave Ian to do that. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled that Ian has found the time uh, to join us. And with that, I will uh, stop sharing Ian and let you, uh, let you take over. Thank you, Tim. And given that we have people from all over the country, good afternoon to some, good morning to others. It really is a pleasure and an honor to be with you today and to talk about how to assess and understand large scale encampments. As Tim mentioned, not only is this part of a three part uh, webinar series we're doing on encampments with the Canadian Alliance, you can consider this first one to be a bit of a setup or preface for the others too, which is why I'll also encourage you that if you have colleagues that are not available on the webinar today that might be attending the future two webinars relative to encampments that they might want to review this recording to help set the stage and we can pick up on some of the elements in future webinars without going too far into the kind of backtracking and repeating of information. I have the great pleasure of leading the Merry Misfits of Org Code uh, as their president and CEO. We are North American leaders in homeless system transformation, leadership development and homeless services and technical assistance. And as Tim mentioned, a lot of the work that we do is in the space of encampments as well as transforming shelters. We also help out with the likes of coordinated access, coordinated entry, uh, program and system evaluations and trying to help communities and organizations within those communities really leverage their strengths to be as effective as possible in reducing and ending homelessness. We also have the opportunity to work with a fair number of elected officials to help them understand issues related to the likes of encampments. We try to disrupt the status quo and be catalysts for better outcomes. The outcome that we're actually seeking relative to the work that we do is that 
homelessness is rare. If it does occur, it's for a short period of time. And if we rehouse people, that they don't return to homelessness. We try to advance ideas, create and share resources, and offer training that at least hopefully doesn't suck. You can learn more about us at orcode.com. Follow me on Twitter at orcode and encourage you to like orcode on Facebook. So this is a rather fulsome agenda. I could probably be spending a larger part of time on every single one of these, which is why I think there's value in the toolkit that we're preparing, being able to provide not only a resource, but a deeper dive into some of the areas that I'm gonna talk about today. I would encourage you, as Tim mentioned, to be posting your questions and hopefully we'll have as much time as possible for answers after I finish presenting on these 11 different elements. And as I said, I'm gonna be hitting them at a kind of a high level as opposed to going into a deep dive into most of these. So how do we set the stage? Well, I set the stage first by saying, I welcome you here. I welcome you here if your organization is directly involved in providing services to homeless encampments. I welcome you here if you are uh, an allied organization, a volunteer, a member of law enforcement, a parks team that's involved in encampments. I welcome you here if you're an advocate and I welcome you here if you are an individual or couple that is living within an encampment. I want this to be an open and inclusive space knowing that there's going to be some disagreements relative to encampments and what we should do about them, but that we should be able to engage in dialogue and work through some of those disagreements rather than becoming entrenched in one position or another. Over the past more than 20 years, I've had exposure to encampments, both large and small scale. I've been able to be involved in encampments both in Canada and the United States and Australia. And if there's one thing that I can say with absolute certainty, is that encampment responses are not one size fits all. I wish I could tell you, here's the exact magical answer of how you go about best providing a strong social service response to encampments that resolves people's homelessness and results in encampments not being reoccupied. I can't offer you that. What I can offer you are considerations where that has been effective over time, and you can start to piece together whether or not what I'm sharing with you makes sense in your local context or requires some amendments to be as effective as possible in your local context. That said, there are some pieces that are pretty much universal in their application in response to encampments, regardless of where you live in the country. And it's those universal elements that I wanna spend more time highlighting today rather than all the nuances and differences that may be experienced from east to west and north and uh, places that are urban, suburban, rural, or remote. What I think encampments usually do is elevate local politics and local political responses to homelessness, but in particular, the encampment itself. And you can really tell uh, a community's approach to how they wanna go about responding to encampments from whether or not they see it as a social nuisance or whether they see it as an opportunity or somewhere in between. All encampments are local, which is to say it's your resources, your community, your staff, your strengths, your expertise, as well as the lived experience of the people in encampments, their resiliency, their strengths, that will frame and uh, form the response that is gonna be most effective locally. When I say that there are competing and contrasting perspectives, I think it would also be fair to say that there are uh, some people that think that uh, there are rights and wrongs and that they will take sides relative to uh, what happens with encampments. What I wanna say is that those competing and contrasting perspectives and opinions can be a rich place for dialogue to actually work together to ensure that people don't have to make the choice to sleep rough if they don't have to. And because there's more than one right answer, I want you to, again, think critically about what I apply in the presentation today to how it make most sense in your local community and the work of your organization. So what are these other two webinars that we're doing in addition to this one? Well, we'll be doing one on mobilizing resources, organizing resources, and establishing a command structure to track and respond to encampments. Now, command structure sounds a bit heavy handed. I, I use that language because a lot of communities are familiar with it relative to command structures and COVID response, or command structures relative to disaster responses, fires, those sorts of things. And as you'll hear me speak as we get into the session, September 29th, one of the best ways to respond to encampments is to think of it as a mass catastrophe. 
And that does require some sort of command structure to organize and mobilize resources in the ways that are gonna be most advantageous to those people impacted by the catastrophe. In our third session in October, we'll be looking at data and mapping and outreach resolution and monitoring efforts and what that means in the context of encampments. So if we're gonna talk about large scale encampments, it would be important for us to come up with some sort of definition of what exactly is a large scale encampment. Well, off the bat, and let me complicate this further to say there is no common definition, but I can tell you the ways that those definitions are created. It usually starts by looking at volume of occupants and or volume of structures. How many people are there and how many, whether it's tents, lean-tos, human-made constructed uh, dwellings, how many are in the area of the encampment? So that's the first part that's often looked at, number of people and number of structures. The second thing that goes into this is whether or not those structures are permanent or quasi-permanent and whether or not there's actually an infrastructure in place to support the encampment. That's when we look at things like hand washing, portable toilets, clean water, food, trash removal, staffing, that sort of stuff. And whether or not that permanence also applies to the occupants of the encampment. Is this an encampment that has generally the same people, give or take, every single day? Or is this an encampment that actually there's a rotating population that goes through it? The length that an encampment has been in place can be another area of existence, or another way of defining it and its existence. So to put this into some context, you can go to some parts of North America where they'll define an encampment as 10 or more people occupying the same place for 10 or more days. You can go to other parts within the continent where it is one or more people that have assembled a permanent or semi-permanent existence relative to their location in place and time. I think that large scale is probably somewhere beyond one person but that said, you could have a number of one-offs within a defined geographic area, let's say a river valley or a park. And even though those are all independent autonomous encampments, because they are geographically linked, even though their leadership structure isn't linked, we might consider them to be one encampment. So I'll start by feeling uh, some, I hope, helpful conversation around is what you're seeing in your community an encampment or is what you're seeing in your community a protest? Now, if they involve homeless individuals, the response is still gonna look the same in terms of trying to end people's homelessness. So I'm not suggesting that the, what we're trying to achieve is different, but the way in which we engage and assess what's going on in the encampment is going to be different, whether or not it is a collection of people experiencing homelessness who are dwelling one space, or whether or not there's a whole bunch of organization, which may include people who don't actually live on the site, organizing and speaking on behalf of people in the site. So what are some of the distinctions that you might look at in determining, are you really addressing an encampment or are you addressing a protest? Encampments may be led by people who are homeless or have no defined leader. So nobody that wants to step up, up and say, I'm in charge here. Those in encampments often desire housing, but we might also be really clear, some people in encampments will be really clear that they're in an encampment because they refuse all offers of assistance, including housing. And encampments over time tend to struggle with ongoing resources and fundamental organization and basic resources to keep the encampment going. Lots of encampments start, especially smaller encampments. Very few reach a threshold of sustainability, but larger encampments do. They reach a threshold of sustainability. And why is that? Well, usually because the degree of organization, the degree of basic resources are more fulsome in that environment. A protest on the other side, often have leaders or advocates that are not homeless, do not reside in the encampment, though may involve people in the encampment or other people experiencing homelessness. They often have a series of demands that need to be met for the encampment to be taken down, and they're usually well-resourced. Food, water, tents, tarps, generators, portable toilets, hand washing, shed structures, communication equipment, access to electricity, and the list goes on. If you can't tell the fundamental difference, you'll struggle to figure out who to engage with, what to engage them regarding, and what the resolution strategies probably look at. Every encounter that I've had with an encampment, from smaller ones that have a few tents to very large ones that have hundreds of people, you have some sort of power dynamic. And those power dynamics become more profound the larger the encampment is, whether it's sanctions or non-sanctioned in its existence. So when we talk about hierarchies often emerging, 
we have to appreciate that those leadership structures can change over time. The people that you're talking to at the beginning of the formation of the encampment may in fact not be the leaders by the time that 20 or 30 more people are there. The hierarchy may have changed. Or you may actually be talking to factions within an encampment that is quite diverse in the opinions and perspectives of the people who are staying there. To think that it's going to be one spokesperson for all people residing in encampment is usually uh, not a good way to go about engaging in communication strategy and resolution. Many uh, encampment, and if you were to look at some of the research that's been done on larger scale encampments, particularly in the Western United States, start with this idea of communal leadership and consensus decision making. And while some of these continue over time, consensus, communal leadership, more often what tends to occur is they become quite hierarchical. And when they become quite hierarchical, other issues emerge in the encampment. It's no longer just, and it's enough to say just, uh, a collection of people who are unsheltered, who are in general proximity to each other, that we start to look at violence or threats of violence used to intimidate or instill order. And the people who actually enforce that violence are not always residents within the encampment. Or the hierarchy will start to result in people at the top not allowing for people uh, that are seen as beneath them to receive access to resources or the same resources, whether that be new tents, food, or even access to outreach workers on site. Or when there's hierarchy in place, those who are leading it may choose to have some people leave the encampment and use power in that regard and enforcement even to get some people to leave the encampment. This has often results in splinter encampments where people that might have started in one location are now occupying two, three, five, ten different locations throughout the community because of these um, visions, uh, these fractures that occur between people in the encampment and the leadership. So how does this relate to the shelter system? Well, all outdoor homelessness is in some way a reaction to or a response to the shelter system. But I want to be really clear, I am in no way blaming the shelter system for all encampments. What I am saying is that sometimes encampments emerge because improvements could be made in the shelter system that had those things been addressed, the encampment would have been what it's become. So I've put a handful of questions here that are often the line of inquiry that we go down when understanding the relationship between occupants of an encampment and the shelter system. First up, are the people who are staying in the encampment people that are barred or service restricted from existing shelters? Which may actually include restricted or barred from every single shelter in that community. If you're a small to mid-sized community, there certainly aren't gonna be as many options as larger to metropolitan communities where the individual may have more than one shelter option. But if you think of being barred or service restricted from all shelters, where else do we expect people to go? If you start to investigate the reasons for those barring and, and service restrictions, and you look at the rationale that's provided to the individual and the length of time they're being asked to leave the shelter, it's no wonder that encampments are a direct consequence of no, having no shelter option for that person. Do the people in the encampment ever use the shelter system, including during winter events, especially if there's inclement weather, really cold or really snowy? What you'll find in some communities is that people who live in encampments will go to particular shelters and often those are temporary or faith-based, uh, say church, synagogue, temple, basements, community rooms, when those open up, maybe through an out of the cold type program. But you'll have other encampments where people don't leave, rain or snow or sunshine, whether it's 40 below or 40 above, that people are gonna stay there. But if you do have some mobility of people going from encampments to other locations, that's an engagement opportunity that can't be lost. Third up, and this gets at one of the myths, there's this dominant perspective that if there are encampments, it must mean because there's not enough space in the shelter system. You can go throughout the country and you'll find that some communities that have some of the largest outdoor homelessness actually have lots of space in their shelter system. So to think that the encampment is a direct result of not having space in the shelter system is wrong. Now it can be as a result of that, but don't assume it always is. And if we are going to look at shelter options as a resolution strategy, not the only strategy, but a resolution strategy for the encampment, we have to ask ourselves, is there enough shelter capacity that could actually accommodate everybody within the encampment? And then go further to ask, what about pets 
because encampments often have people with pets. And what about people's belongings? We're understanding that in a lot of encampments, people acquire more belongings than they would have if, had they been staying in shelter the entire time. Do any shelters have barriers that would make it difficult or impossible for encampment residents to make use of the shelter? This could come through a whole host of different reasons, but those barriers might include things like, like hours a day that access is required, but also gets at things like whether or not shelters in the community are operating from a harm reduction philosophy and whether or not they've imposed barriers related to substance use that actually aren't directly related to uh, anything other than a desire to keep people who have been using out. So it doesn't look at behavior, it looks at use. Lastly, the question I put here, where are shelters located in the proximity to where the encampments is or are located? Sometimes the encampment comes up because there's no shelter within walking distance or proximity, no easy public transportation route between where they are and where the shelter is. But you also see some encampments emerge within smaller communities, including rural communities, where there's no shelter within that community at all. Now remember, if you're gonna go down the road as shelter as a response for an encampment, if you add additional shelter capacity, there's no legal mechanism that exists to force people to use shelter. It is voluntary. We can involuntarily apprehend people who are harmed themselves or others under very specific conditions in most jurisdictions, but choosing to live outside is not one of those conditions. So you might think, or your elected officials might think, we'll just open up a warming center or a new shelter or expand our capacity and everybody that's in the encampment will go, outside, go inside and the problem is solved. And that fundamentally isn't true. What do we know about large scale encampments? That they occur in all sorts of city sizes. So what is often, um, I think, perplexing to some is to realize that in rural and remote areas, you can still have large scale encampments depending upon your definition of large. And there have been those sorts of encampments for quite some time. Well, Tim mentioned, and I agree, that there's been a rise in encampments relative to COVID. That doesn't mean that there weren't encampments pre-COVID. Acuity data does not support the notion that the most vulnerable in a community are in large scale encampments. They tend to be in smaller encampments, including single person encamps if living outdoors. And this is based upon analysis we've done in a few communities now. In those communities use VI spadat. Uh, but the comparison of people in different types of encampments, those who are, tend to be more reclusive and by themselves most often had higher acuity than individuals within large scale encampments. Now, I don't think that's universal, but that's why I say it seems. There are loads of ideas of what should be done and where do those ideas come from? Well, they often come from people who don't understand homelessness, who have never studied or been involved in encampments. So you might have an encampment in your community and you have lots of really great shelter workers and we think, well, we'll send our shelter staff down to the encampment, but they've never dealt with an encampment before. So their expertise in homelessness may be not enough to know how to be experts in responding to encampments. Or it's by people who know nothing about service organization of do, service orientation, of doing the work effectively, harm reduction, trauma-informed care, using motivational interviewing, the practice of assertive engagement, et cetera. And a lot of people don't understand that it's not illegal to be homeless. Though, as I say here, what people do while homeless and where people are homeless may be illegal. The actual act of being homeless and being outside is not an illegal one. People who are homeless have access to public space. Where the tension seems to come in is, can people turn public space into private space if there's insufficient housing resources? It's common for there to be evolutions in large scale encampments over time. In particular, this starts with this idea of who's there. The same nucleus of people who started it may remain for a long period of time, but don't be surprised if you come to learn that your encampment was started by one group only to be occupied or overwhelmed by a different set of people over time. Encampments evolve over time in terms of what they want. What well, might start with a position relative to lack of affordable housing and those individuals in the encampment saying that they don't like shelters, but they do want to be housed, could quickly evolve into a whole litany of injustices that are trying to be resolved through the encampment. How they wish to be engaged. You might start by working with the encampment, even as it's growing, having one or two spokespersons, leaders, sometimes called mayors. And these sorts of individuals do a good job in the early days, 
of getting the opinions and perspectives of other people staying within the encampment. But if that leadership changes, who you engage with and how you engage with them can change. Larger encampments, not always, but most often have greater resource access. The size of the encampment will change over time. And as encampments start to gain notoriety, expect there to be some people who knew nothing about the encampment before it started to get some sort of media inkling or media attention or community uproar that then want to go start responding to the encampment. That will include everything from professional service providers to in some instances police where the encampment was let's say below the radar or not of interest to them but now there is a presence but can also include really well-intentioned volunteers, student groups, social work students, or very vocal advocates who want to both support people who are homeless as well as put out positions relative to scarcity of affordable housing as an example. The bigger they get and the longer they're around, the greater the likelihood that there will be pressure to resolve it. Even if it starts relatively small, once you get to a critical mass, that's when people start to notice it. And we're approaching one of those times of the year in lots of parts of the country where people may start to notice some large scale encampments that were protected by the leaves for a period of time. But as those leaves start to fall, then people will start to see that large scale encampments are there. And people who have no interaction with the encampment but maybe drive by it now see it as an eyesore and want it to be resolved right away. And when there's that pressure to resolve it, the go to in most instances is law enforcement by law enforcement or some sort of park staff who's responsible for that area. Even though time and again, it is our experience that the most effective solution is through a coordinated response that includes social workers, especially street outreach workers, and I will say highly trained and experienced street outreach workers. And this is not an entry level position in terms of what we're asking people to do in response to encampments. The last thing they'll say relative to commonplace, the longer that they're around, the more difficult it is to understand what each person's needs are and how to find a resource to match those needs. So it becomes almost overwhelming to the system to have capacity to know how to effectively respond. A mature measured response accepts that there will be conflict. I have yet to experience any encounter with encampments where there wasn't some conflict. People who want to be in the encampment or support the people in the encampment have one position, and those that want it dismantled and never seen again as fast as possible have other positions. What we need to do is have an effective response that allows us to try to resolve whatever the precipitating issues were that caused the encampment from a social service response with the coordination of others. Making sure that we're not starting to advocate that public space becomes private space. That's a slippery slope and one that becomes almost intractable. Where we get into one of our next webinars around the structure of communication organization is gonna get into this communication coordinated response more and serving the way out of encampments is preferred over enforcement, but service also needs to be accountable to outcomes and timelines. It's not service ad infinitum, that there's certain things that need to be accomplished within a certain period of time and Yes, it can take time to establish trust. You'll hear this all the time. And I would agree with that. But trust is not the outcome that we're seeking. Trust is the vehicle to achieve the outcome. History can repeat itself. What do we know about large scale encampments? We know that you could come up with an effective solution to get everybody served out of the encampment and the encampment will reemerge with different people. What do they stay in, say in real estate? Location, location, location. Some of the locations of encampments are prime real estate for encampments. They're within close proximity of services. It's easy enough to, for example, find your way to the downtown and other resources. It's not so far of a walk that it's impossible. Perhaps there's a bathroom close by that's open if there isn't one within the encampment itself. We also know that some people housed on the encampment if they lose their housing, may return to encampments. May not be the same one, but will return to encampments. Very different from someone who loses their housing and returns to shelter. And debriefing becomes really important. It's the woulda, coulda, shouldas that tend to come up where there's actually rich learning.
if you and your community can work your way through one encampment and you take the time to debrief what worked well and what didn't work well, how decisions were made, how resources were allocated, time frames, the ability to engage everybody within the encampment effectively, to engage effectively with leadership, it becomes easier to respond to future encampments. What isn't going to work particularly well is if you don't debrief and people start making assumptions of what worked and didn't work in the response. So, if we have encampments, like most of you do, during the time of COVID, there are some very specific considerations. And I don't see from the work that I've been able to do remotely predominantly, uh, I haven't been in the field as much, is that in some jurisdictions they're doing this well, and in some jurisdictions it's not happening well at all. So one of the first things, and if we look at the American documentation from the CDC, they're really clear, don't sweep encampments. And so people start to assume that means that all encampments as they are can have nothing done with them while COVID is happening. Those same people didn't read the entire CDC document, nor is it aligned with what I would say is the most appropriate service response, which is no arbitrary sweeps of encampments. So no just saying, we're gonna go push everybody out of here. But if you can demonstrate that service offers have been exhausted, which can include housing, that there are safety issues. And I'm not talking about piddly safety issues that people want to make a mountain out of a molehill. I'm talking about absolute potential loss of life as a result of how the encampment is configured. Or if it's a protest, if this is about political uh, endeavors, is this about using people experiencing homelessness as pawns, which let's be honest, happens, not always, but happens, then that can certainly play a role into the response that goes into the encampment. But I'll start with the first two things because I think they're more important in this context. Have you been able to actually exhaust service options? Do you have housing to provide or alternative solutions to provide? And are there safety issues? What are the sort of other things we'd look at though if it was seemingly safe and those weren't issues? Is there adequate separation between the tents? Some outreach workers that I know of have had to help reconfigure larger scale encampments so that there can be adequate separation between, for example, tents within that encampment and decrease the likelihood of exposure. Large scale encampments can benefit from hand washing and hand sanitizer stations, portable toilets, safe food access and preparation. And given that in addition to a homelessness crisis and a pandemic, we're also dealing with an overdose crisis making sure that there's Narcan on site with people trained on its administration, which can include trained peers who actually have access to Narcan as necessary. Prevention versus reaction in large scale encampments. Rarely do they start large. Most often they start small, which if they're starting small or smaller, kind of begs the question, well, what did we do when it wasn't this big? If there isn't some sort of early detection mechanism, which gets down into the use of very targeted outreach services, then these things can start to blossom and get out of hand without knowing who was there, how it started, who the leadership was, what their intention was, what their desires were, and how we can go about resolving it. If it seems to shock to people that just overnight there's a large scale encampment, uh, that would be unusual. I mean, it happens, but it would be unusual. From the beginning, we can put a bunch of safety measures in place. If we wait until it gets too large, trying to get the right separation distance, for example, becomes really difficult. I talked a little bit about leadership. I'll say it again. Assessing who the leaders are when they're smaller and having that dialogue as opposed to waiting until different hierarchies emerge within the encampment is helpful. And what's the reason behind the encampment? Because the faster you can address or respond this, the better off everybody's going to be. So if it, for example, is I hate the shelter system, but I wanna be housed, then I would say, okay, let's accept that that opinion at face value, whether or not we agree or disagree with their sentiments of the shelter and ask ourselves, so have we prioritized unsheltered homelessness and a coordinated access system? Are the people who are there already on our by name list? Or are these people that have been flying below the radar that actually haven't had intensive services or don't have a pathway towards housing that's emerged? Should our community have large sanctioned encampments? Hmm. 
All right, I will express an opinion based upon having worked with a few large sanctioned encampments. No. No, you might have a different opinion, but let me explain my opinion and rationale on this first. The best data I've seen relative to the costs of a sanctioned encampment come from the big island of Hawaii. So yes, it's an American reference. They calculated that if you included staff time, even though they had trash services in kind, it cost 22,146 US dollars per month to operate the sanctioned encampment. Now I've seen other people try to calculate costs associated with encampments, but they're not accounting for the staff time that goes into them. Remember the staff time that's invested in an encampment is staff time that can't be used in other parts of your system of care. That staff are not free, this is a profession. And so if we start to add that up, we start to ask ourselves, is there something different we could be doing with that sort of money on a monthly basis? Now it's probably insufficient to give everybody a rent supplement and it's probably not fair to do it, nor is it necessarily fair to say that it'd be cheaper to use social housing. But it doesn't mean that we can't look at alternatives because if you have a sanctioned encampment, what's the end game? A lot of places that start a sanctioned encampment will say things like, well, when the housing market gets better, when the summer is over, but it's always pushing off the when. And we might even agree, okay, well, all of our criteria are met. I guess it's time to wind it down. And well, there's still people there. What are the alternatives? A strong housing orientation is a start. That would get at whether or not your entire system is housing oriented and or whether or not you've been able to put mechanisms in place that will actually allow for people to get housed out of the encampment. That includes things like not just saying unsheltered people might be a priority within your system, but unsheltered for a period of time, going back to our initial definition, Sometimes it's not just the presence of being outside, it's how long you've been outside. Could shelter be an alternative for people staying outside? Well, back to my piece around the shelter system, it might be entirely appropriate and available. It might be that some shelter operators are willing to change some of their practices to be more inviting for people who are sleeping outside. If we can pop up motels in the way that we have for, as part of the COVID response, then, and this has been used even pre-COVID, could we use motels as a strategy for coming up with a resolution to the encampment and giving ourselves time where people might be in another safe location while we try to figure out longer term housing objectives for people? And what's the cost of that? Is that the cost comparable or less than the cost of actually serving the encampment? Could we do as some other communities have started to do, put in stand up or sprung structures into place? Think of it as a remarkably big heated tent. And if you go that route, it doesn't mean that you have to now operate a shelter within that space. You could still allow people, for example, to be inside tents inside a large sprung structure that is going to provide opportunity for greater safety and security at the front door, as well as some removal of threat, threats that come from the environment and uh, the weather. Or you could look at converted spaces. And I've only seen a few instances where this has happened over a long term, but this is where we get into the likes of community centers, warehouses, different locations that were never intended for people to occupy, certainly not occupy for long periods of time, where we start to look at the opportunities to have those become respite spaces or phase down spaces or service rich spaces. Now with all of these housing people, shelter, motels, sprung structures, converted space, it is gonna require you to know a lot about who is in the encampment to make sure that you don't suddenly have a whole bunch of people who leave shelter, who go onto the streets to get access to one of these resources because I think it's preferable. What complicates a measured response to large scale encampments? So I put together a handful, there's probably more. Using police as social workers, I wanna be really clear. I'm not saying that police shouldn't have a role and that police can't be empathetic and there can't be great community-based policing. There absolutely can. But when we get to encampments, we often think, well, the police should take the lead and do all the interviewing with people, but the police may not know all the resources or how those resources work or how coordinated access works or how assessments are done. Too many well-intentioned misguided volunteers. Encampments can become remarkably busy places 
without any coordination whatsoever. It's kind of like if I go back to my mass catastrophe response, imagine a large aircraft suddenly crashed in your community. At first, it might be all hands on deck to come and help out survivors. But at some point, as the professional response starts to take place at the crash site, we don't want every person that is well-intentioned to now start to rush onto the scene. We need it to be much more controlled and thoughtful of who exactly is trying to engage, what is their purpose, how long are they gonna be there, and how does it connect to the common mission? Common issue, response to the encampment at the expense of the rest of the system. This is when you could say the robbing Peter to pay Paul starts to happen. We start to divert resources, needed resources from one part of the system to respond to the encampment and then put the people in the encampment further up on the ladder of access to resources than someone who might have been homeless for longer but was never in an encampment. So there has to be a balance there in terms of determining how we will prioritize resources for people and not make sure that people are become more disadvantaged if they were never in an encampment, but also experiencing homelessness. Poverty point and voyeuristic media. Some people want to use encampments to make their case around the plights of homelessness or economic poverty, and certainly media outlets love to go in and do the person on the scene interview with encampment uh, occupants, residents. Um, this can become an issue, especially if it's not painting the whole picture of what's going on. I had the experience uh, January of being in Washington, D.C. and responding to uh, a large-scale encampment. And I'll tell you, the, watching the reporters work through the encampment made it very difficult for other people to do their work, uh, in large part because the power dynamics that were involved, the representation in the media became a bit of an issue, and some people were happy to let media into their lives, and a lot of other encampment occupants weren't as happy as doing that. Last common issue I see is people exclusively speaking on behalf of all people in an encampment rather than empowering the voice and strengths of all people within the encampment. Yes, it can be helpful to have representatives that are kind of go-tos, but it becomes problematic if we don't hear what the opinions and perceptions and opportunities are from all people within the encampment. How do we assess an encampment once it begins? And we'll be going further in this in the subsequent webinars as well, getting at how do we operationalize this. So it starts with the basics. How many people in the encampment have already been assessed and included on your by name list? How many people need to be assessed and put on your by name list? Two, do you have a daily understanding of who's there, additions and subtractions, and the number of structures? Because these things can change, not seemingly overnight, really overnight. How many pets are there? How do you survey the site for obvious safety issues? Are any specific fire safety issues articulated by the fire department? So some encampments I've been to are a stiff wind and a match away from burning down. I'm not gonna say that we have to dismantle the entire encampment, but if we can prevent loss of life by, for example, altering how people are cooking or increasing the amount of space to where people are living, we should probably do that. Any legal issues that need to be addressed, I'm not talking about minor infractions, I'm not talking about doing warrant checks on people. I'm not talking about busting people's chops for no reason. One of the other encampments that I was in late last year had a fair amount of human trafficking that was occurring within the encampment. That was particularly problematic and needed to be addressed. And then who are the agencies, organizations, advocates, and unaffiliated people on the site? What's their role and how does it relate to the mission? We can have many hands on deck, all doing great things in partnership, working to come up with the best possible results for people who are occupying the encampment, or we can become entrenched in arguments, or we can have unknown people showing up, and we can have new power dynamics, not amongst people who are in the encampment, but amongst the people who say that they're there to support people in the encampment. I would urge you to create a chronicity and acuity matrix of everybody that's in your encampment. Who's the most acute, most, uh, most, acute, most chronic person in the encampment? They get to occupy the top right-hand quadrant and the top right-hand square. And then everybody else is in reference to that person. So less chronic or less acute. Once we start to create this matrix, it becomes a lot clearer what type of intensity of service response we likely need for different types of occupants within the encampment, rather than assuming homogeneity that just because you're an encampment, all of your needs are exactly the same, that's false. Then assessing both individuals
their living situation in the encampment itself. So are there permanent or semi-permanent structures on site? Are people prepared for most weather eventualities? How is the trash managed on site? And is there hoarding present? If we think about housing solutions for people in encampments, if people are saying yes to structures, weather preparation, managing trash, and no to hoarding, that's a high degree of organization. It's really difficult to keep a tent going year round or to replace your tent as needed or to create a structure that is weatherproof and to be prepared for everything from when it's really humid and hot in the summer to freezing cold or wet and rainy in the winter. And managing trash, yes, some encampments are well served by having trash management assistance, the ability to have trash pickup, and that can be highly effective. But we can also see some encampments become places of squalor when trash isn't picked up. And then we are presented with a range of other risks, potentially, because the trash just isn't managed well within the site. Second thing that we want to look at is people and pets. Are there minors on the site? And if so, what's the relationship to the adult or the adults on site? There may be a legal duty to report. Are there pets other than cats and dogs? And even with that, it's assuming that you could find landlords in your community that would rent to someone with a cat or a dog, but it's when we get into lizards and ferrets and rats and mice and leeches and other exotic pets that people may have a hard time finding rental accommodation. Again, it's not a no, it's just what do we need to know to assess? If animals are present, are they generally in good, good condition and are their food and water needs met? So minors on site, problematic if the adult isn't their legal guardian. Pets other than cats and dogs present unique challenges but are not a no or unhousable. But if someone is struggling to take care of their pet, they're probably also struggling to take care of themselves. Ability to meet daily needs. So within the encampment, do they have access to water within 15 minutes of whatever mode of transportation is usually used? Access to a toilet, and both of those usually within 15 minutes. Access to shower, food, storage of food, safe preparation of food, access to clothing, access to laundry. Some encampments, because of their proximity and infrastructure, are highly organized in this regard. Some encampments are nowhere close to being organized enough to meet these needs. If we say that people don't have access to water and a toilet, that's the most problematic of all of these uh, in terms of being able to maintain good hygiene within the site and take care of those basic needs. And then what are the reasons for disengagement from other services amongst the occupants within the site? Is it that they're barred or service restricted? Is it that they had a bad experience? Is it because of rules and other service providers? Is it because they're trying to avoid conflict with staff or other service users? With this, I don't say it necessarily says that what the person tells me is 100% accurate 100% of the time, but I want to understand credibility of their reasons. In other words, are they in the encampment because it's a well thought out position, because they had nowhere else to go, because alternatives would actually make sense to them if they were presented, et cetera. Income and housing history. So this is unscientific. This is just based upon engagement with people in a series of encampments that they seem to say, if they have at least $1,000 a month, that there's more opportunities for them to escape the encampment than people who don't have at least $1,000 a month. And that can include money through informal means, panhandling, bottle collecting, those sorts of things. And then whether or not they've had permanent housing at some point in the community in the last six months, and or whether or not they've had some sort of um, housing in a different community for a period of time. This will help us with looking for landlord and housing options for people within the encampment and figure out where we might need more resources, not less to assist people. And then presence of hazards. So getting at sharps, needles, those sorts of things. Propane tanks is a famous uh, encampment. I keep saying Cleveland, but it might've been Cincinnati. It's just a couple of years back, but it was guys underneath the bridge with propane tanks and they did millions of dollars of damage accidentally to the bridge because they lit fires and the place blew up. Is there meth production on or near the site? Not because I don't think people should make, you know, be able to make choices relative to the use of meth, but meth production can be very dangerous and put other people in peril in the encampment. Whether or not there's exploitive sex work on site, whether or not there's violence, including domestic violence on the site, whether there's stolen property on site. And I'll say like, I'll look beyond, you know, a bicycle here or there and start to look at like large volumes of stolen goods being uh, used or using the encampment to, store large quantities of stolen goods, and whether or not there's abetting others on the site. 
And for here, a string of no's indicates very low risk in moving forward. And then problem solving and known conflict. This is where sometimes if we know what a closure date or an end date is of an encampment, it actually can be beneficial in the conversations with encampment occupants to come up with social service solutions, especially if there is a known plan by bylaw, police, or any other entity to remove the encampment. If there's an encampment disagreement, um, so when we say that there's a known conflict with other encampments with threatening destruction of encampment, people will take knives to each other's encampments or start fires in each other's encampments overnight. Is there a known conflict with business or neighbors with threatening destruction of the encampment? So this might help us figure out a plan of urgency. So that is the high level version of the introduction to how do you assess and understand large scale encampments. I hope that there's some food for thought some critical thinking that goes on. Again, it's not all the answers are starting to frame uh, the ways that we can look at the issue as we move forward in the subsequent webinars. Tim, over to you to man the qu uh, question and answers. All right, on. Uh, thanks Ian. So um, there's a number of questions here. I invite anybody that has a question or a comment you'd like Ian to react to, um, please put it in the, in the Q&A. Uh, first question from Sarah, what are some good ways you've seen to address or prevent increasing safety issues or predatory behaviors when hierarchies are an influence? I think if you can start when the encampment hasn't got to a mammoth of manageable size, it's a little bit easier to not only uh, have regular access to all occupants of the encampment, so you can do some of that early detection of whether or not there's people are being preyed upon if that, that sort of behavior is happening. And there can also be um, work that's done with the encampment residents to come to an agreement that they don't want to allow other people to come into their encampment site. That strategy is used quite effectively quite a lot. Um, if you stay the current size, we could probably figure out how to best support all of you. If this encampment continues to get larger, it's going to be more problematic for us to engage with you. So that's one strategy. When there is predatory behavior that's occurring, I think we have to ask yourself, what's the nature of the predatory behavior? Uh, and uh, again, I'm not interested in minor offenses and um, those sorts of things, but if it is getting into the realm of uh, sexual violence, rape, um, torture, forced confinement, those sorts of issues with men, women, or non-binary uh, individuals, that's really problematic and might warrant bringing in other people to help you strategize from a safety perspective. I has also said in one slide that um, looking at safety from the perspective of fire safety, not to eliminate the encampment, but to make changes in the encampment as necessary so that it decreases the likelihood of everybody dying if there's, uh, you know, a stiff wind in a match. Um, there's a comment from Anna that I think that plays into a significant, uh, I think, tension um, when we're talking about encampments. And, and Anna says, I have a number of significant concerns in the false divide between encampment versus protest. This plays into a narrative both courts and politicians use to undermine the legitimacy of camps, undermines the support and organization homeless residents rely on. The idea that housed people are a sign of protest ignores that many housed people were recently themselves homeless and these are their friends and allies. This framing also ignores that organized political protest camps are often most successful in forcing political institutions to provide housing solutions. So I wasn't saying one was better or worse. I was saying that the response to them is different. Yeah. Um, another comment from a uh, question from Elizabeth. We hear people, we hear from people in encampments that they don't want shelter and they don't want housing. They like camping because it's free and they can keep all of their income, whereas even affordable housing will involve a loss of disposable income. Any ideas? Yeah. If people want to continue to camp and stay outside, one of the strategies used in one of the jurisdictions we work with in Northern California got people vouchers for a campground that was in proximity to the community where the camp was happening. So they were willing to pay for people's camping experience in a place that camping is actually encouraged and lawful as opposed to taking over public space, especially when it starts to impede upon rights of way. So for example, an encampment on a sidewalk that requires people to walk into traffic to get around it is going to be problematic for just about everybody involved. But if it really was, you want to camp and you like the freedom and you don't want to pay for it, well, we do have mechanisms that we can use to allow that lifestyle to continue. Uh, 
Um, Scott's asking, uh, isn't moving people into hotels or short, a short-sighted response if it doesn't happen in conjunction with sufficient support services? Would a sanctioned encampment not be better in that case? I think motels with supports. I'm not suggesting motels without supports. Um, Monica's asking, uh, how to get a government, to, how do you get a government to understand that providing water and toilet access to encampments is not enabling? Mm. This I kind of think comes from the safety perspective again, and this is where I think there is some good literature from public health representatives, both in Canada and the United States, um, that if we do get to a certain density, it's not enabling to say that we want there to be good hygiene, that we want there to be uh, decreased risk of disease transmission. Those are all very positive things, and that you can actually have uh, an informed, calculated response to working effectively with an encampment that brings in water, that brings in portable toilets, that brings in food from an inspected site, and isn't going to be having people stay longer. It's not about there's no uh, desire to provide the, the support services. It actually is saying, look, we are going to support you in the same way that we want you to have access to clean water and hygiene facilities in a shelter. There's really, I don't make a big difference there that from a public health perspective, it's an imperative, not an enabling. Um, Elizabeth is asking, can you talk more about the well-intentioned but misguided volunteers? What's the mm. So let's say you have a good strategy in place with uh, people who are in the encampment um, and working on housing resolution as an example. Uh, working on housing resolution, you have um, uh, street outreach workers going down on a regular basis who are actively engaged with occupants of the encampment. You have a strategy and you know, let's say uh, police are not being too intrusive. Um, and so everything seems to be going well. And then you have, because uh, I've seen it more than once, a big church group that shows down and wants to start evangelizing to everybody in the encampment. And in exchange for listening to their message, they'll give them a meal. Um, that can make things more difficult because it, it, there's something that those volunteers want or like about the density of people outside and a need makes their um, work easier. So that would be an example of misguided. Another misguided volunteer that I've seen uh, more than once is people going down to encampments and offering people places to live in their homes, uh, but without any of the supports and connection to social services. And, um, you know, I appreciate their generosity, but I also think that we want there to be a good support structure in place for people that uh, is, is not going to put people in place where there's potentially ethical or boundary violations. Um, there's uh, another question from Toronto that's asking about well, your thoughts on the pros and cons of churches allowing encampments on their property? I think that churches will always be able to maintain their right of what they want to occur on their property. Uh, I think that is ultimately up to the church, uh, especially if it's not impeding on, you know, people's public right away and those sorts of things. And I think that where there is the potential for concern is how do other people respond to that? If the church is willing to weather that storm in the messaging, that's great, but I've also seen churches that start from that perspective, the encampment's still there, let's say three or four or six months later, and then they wanna search for a response from government officials or the police to say, well, we, we don't want people on our property anymore. And then there's more conflict that can come up from that. So uh, I think faith-based organizations can be vital in response to encampments, but I wouldn't also suggest that uh, we should only have sanctioned encampments on church properties or faith-based organization properties uh, throughout our cities. Um, good segue to the next question from uh, Caitlin, who's asking, how do you deal with the tension and conflict between encampments and the activists or organizations supporting encampments and the local municipal leaders in the city? So we'll get into this some more in terms of organizing that structure of how we respond in the next webinar. So I, I don't want to give away, you know, all my thoughts on that at this point, but suffice to say, we need to figure out who is speaking for whom. So who's speaking for themselves, who's speaking for others. Uh, that we have to understand, as I've experienced in some encampments, that when there are external spokespeople, sometimes they do a great job of really engaging with people in the encampment and bringing together a community consensus voice. And sometimes they have their own agenda and the people in the encampments are pawns. And if it's only when we understand our engagement structure that we can actually have effective communication to know that those sorts of conversations, whether they are with municipal leaders and people speaking on behalf of the encampment or municipal leaders and people who profess to be leaders on the encampment, 
and the social service sector that we're talking to the right people and that we've come to a, a common understanding that of what is the end game going to be. Uh, and that's what I'll say that where a lot of the conflict comes from is people don't want to have a transparent conversation early on around where is this all headed? Is this supposed to get larger? Is it supposed to get, because that requires a certain response. Are we supposed to legalize this? That requires a different response. Are we supposed to be shutting this down? That requires a different response. And I don't start from the position that any of those are foregone conclusions until we actually have the right people who are having engaged and sometimes facilitate a dialogue with each other. Excellent. Um, another question here says, uh, you said, uh, actually it's asking, did you say 15 minute travel time to the nearest potable water or toilets? That seems far away if you could explain more. But also asking, uh, what are safer ways uh, for people to cook? Often people want to remove all combustible materials, which most people use for cooking. Yeah, so the 15 minutes actually came from a very large scale encampment that we worked on when we engaged with the residents within the encampment. Uh, they generally said if it's within 15 minutes, whether that was on their bicycle walking or even some of them had cars, uh, that they could manage their daily needs if it was within 15 minutes. Now, would I personally say that, you know, I could survive with the washroom 15 minutes away? Probably not. Uh, but I'll use that as a general barometer based upon of what we've heard in those consultations. Um, but it could be less than that. On the matter of cooking, that's where a lot of the safety hazards come in. I mean, if you look at like loss of life, whether it's carbon monoxide poisoning or fires or those sorts of things, there's a reason why we have fire safety in place. And just because you live in a camp, it doesn't mean there shouldn't be fire safety. So if we don't want people to have like their own stoves with, you know, propane containers, or if we don't want people to be having open fires and grilling food, then let's give people either access to food from a safe inspected source that comes into the site, or let's actually put the right equipment on site that will allow people to cook carefully. So I'm not suggesting in any way, shape or form, we're just going to start busting out everybody's like portable Coleman stove and saying you can't have this without presenting alternatives of how people will address their food security. There was a comment here on the remember that you put at the bottom of one of your slides and uh, Anna's saying that that's, that's wrong in British Columbia law. The number of shelter beds is a primary factor in uh, whether a municipality can succeed in an injunction to evict a camp. Shelter beds are routinely opened and spaces reserved in order to justify ethical encampment. Yes, but can you force people to go? Can you force people to stay? No. If you took me to a homeless shelter, I could turn around and walk out the next day. They're not prisons. Okay. Uh, looks like our last question, if anybody... Uh, oh, one more question here. Okay. Uh, so Elizabeth is asking, hoarding is a big issue. Many people won't access shelters because they have too much stuff. But everyday good Samaritans deliver more and more of this stuff to the encampment. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think one of the things we can and should be doing on a regular basis with large scale encampments is having um, from time to time, I'm certainly not suggesting that we leave a big dumpster at the encampment, but give people the opportunity to get rid of their trash. So I've seen everything from, you know, Friday is going to be the day that we bring in a dumpster and everybody can throw what they don't want into a dumpster on that day and then it gets hauled away to regular trash pickup as a part of a municipal trash pickup, at least that's what it seems to me, uh, where people can essentially put all their trash into one location and then it'll get taken away by as part of usual garbage col uh, collection. So um, I agree that the, it's not always hoarding, sometimes it's just a collection of stuff or it's not giving people the uh, tools they need to get rid of their trash even if they want to. So if we can actually help solve those issues, Again, solving some of these like pragmatic issues allows us to engage with uh, the residents around solutions to their homelessness in ways that we're not distracted by the noise of the fact that there's lots of stuff or um, uh, the people think that your camp is an eyesore and they just want to tear it down. Excellent. Okay, and um, so a couple more, I guess a couple more came in. So Kelly's asking, how can an encampment residents support or promote change in shelter of the broader, or the broader homeless sector? Often various agencies can be guilty of finger pointing at those who are coordinating responses. I, I missed the first part of that question, Tim. So if you could just uh, repeat how, that. Yeah, how can encampment residents support or promote change in the shelter system or the broader homeless sector? Well, one of the things we did in a Canadian community, um, 
I want to say it was two winters ago, but engaged with people living outside in the dead of winter and uh, having the conversation with them about what changes they would see, want to see made within the shelter system uh, to make it a place that they would want to go. Now, that doesn't mean that, that the recipient of that information is always going to say, oh, thanks for bringing that to my attention. We'll get right on that. But giving people an active voice to say, what would the changes need to be for you to accept shelter if that's one of the prongs of our strategy? And I, I, I don't think it's the total strategy, but it can be part of the strategy of sheltering. And if there are legitimate barriers that can be resolved, especially the stuff that can be resolved without more resources, then I do think we need to take a careful look and lean into that as a community to see what can be done. Excellent. Um, Scott's asking, uh, has a sanctioned encampment ever been considered a permanent and valuable aspect of a homeless serving system in a market that you are aware of? So there are some very long lasting uh, encampments. I wouldn't say that they're part of the homeless service delivery system, but they are been sustainable uh, and well run. Uh, probably the biggest one is in Honolulu uh, in Hawaii, um, and that is all run by the residents. Um, it is, uh, I think, uh, probably one of the only ones that I've ever seen that has done a good job of building infrastructure and partnership with neighbors, uh, as opposed to seeing themselves as adversaries or them being seen as the adversary. So I do think that that can actually happen, uh, but it didn't start as a sanctioned encampment. It has just evolved into a sanctioned encampment over time. So I think one of the other things that happened with sanctioned environments is in a lot of instances, we don't ask the people who would be living in the environment what they want. We take a whole bunch of well-designed social engineer sort of constructs of like separation and resource allocation. And then we say, and now we're going to select who lives in the sanctioned encampment. And that is, can be very difficult because then finger pointing starts to happen. The last uh, comment and question is from Karen, who is uh, saying, how are we going to deal with the huge and unspoken issue of the lack of good quality seniors housing and rising numbers of unhoused seniors uh, and where we have seen long term care across the country fail so badly during COVID? We need to start talking about homelessness and obviously this is a senior homelessness and obviously this is a vulnerable group. I'd say, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. <laughs> I don't know even if you had any other. Any I'd other also say you're right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, Ian, well, thank you uh, very much. I'm just going to if I get you to stop sharing for just a yeah, second. Yeah, I'm doing that up, right now. There uh, we go. I will put up um, the screen here quickly just to uh, want to let you know about uh, the upcoming uh, webinars. We have uh, three, uh, two more webinars uh, coming with Ian on the 29th. Uh, of September and the 27th of October. Uh, we will also be, uh, Ian's also going to develop a uh, toolkit and we have a discussion about uh, how we might, uh, our first draft of a toolkit coming out soon and hopefully we'll have a conversation about how we might uh, uh, engage uh, the community in some feedback. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Ian, for a terrific webinar. I think the lots of uh, lots of interest, lots of engagement. We will be posting the, uh, we'll be posting the webinar uh, on our website at the, um, uh, on, on the Community Alliance and Homelessness website. Uh, that'll be, it should be there this afternoon. And if Ian's okay, we might PDF and put his uh, presentation on there uh, as well, just so everybody has it handy. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you, Ian. Have a great My day. My pleasure. Great thank weekend, you. Everyone. See you all very soon.